Lord, we thank you so much for another opportunity we have to dig deep and bring up the hidden treasures of your word. May the Holy Spirit touch our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. We are looking at lesson number nine. And uh, the focal point of this lesson is going to be Abraham's and uh, Sarah's name change. So Abraham is changed to Abraham and Sarai is changed to Sarah. If you look on your worksheet, the first thing you can see there is a chiastic structure that starts at the end of chapter 11 and goes all the way to the end of chapter 22. Last time, I showed you a larger chiasm that looks like this. And uh, the center was God remembered Abraham. The chiastic structure we are looking at now is here. So it's this piece here. And the central piece or the focal point is Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. On both sides, the story has some genealogies. The genealogy of Terah, the father of Abram, and genealogy of Nahor, the brother of Abraham. Then in section B, you have a command, a divine command on one side and the other that starts with go forth. So you see that in chapter 12, right at the beginning, and chapter 22, right at the beginning. Then we have two sections on one side and the other of uh, Abraham's wife being taken by a foreign king and then she's given back to Abram and Abraham. We also have at point D the defeat of Sodom and the destruction of Sodom on the other hand. In both situations, Abraham is the one that goes to rescue Lot. Point E is a covenant story on both sides of the name change. So we have the name change here, and we have these ideas parallel on one side and the other. Okay? The reason I'm pointing out the chiastic structure is to make your life easier and your study more interesting. I'm trying to train us in a Hebraic way of looking at scriptures. Just the way the Greek mind is uh, trained by the school to go from A to B and then to C, a Jewish mind is trained to go from A to B to C to D to E and then go backwards. And the focal point is right there. So let's look at the story of the name change. In chapter 15, you have first a covenant between God and Abraham. That's the first mentioning of the word covenant in the Abraham story. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Abram at this time is 86 years old. How do I know? You can look in uh, chapter 16, verse 16. So when Abraham is 86, God comes to him in a vision and says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Some translations say, your reward is exceedingly great. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless. So at this time, we still deal with Abram. So God comes to him and tells him, Abraham, I'm your shield. I'm your exceedingly great reward. If the other translation is preferred, then your reward is exceedingly great. And Abraham says, okay, Lord, but what will you give me since I go childless? I have no children. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir, meaning this servant of his was born in his house, but obviously he was not his biological child. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. So God tells him specifically, hey, not this guy, not the servant, somebody coming from your own body. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And there's a statement here very, very important in the story because later on, The New Testament comes back again and again and reflects back to this statement. And he, that is Abram, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in the Lord. He was 86, had no children. The Lord tells him, Abraham, you will have an heir coming from your own body. The Hebrew says your own loins. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he believed in the Lord, but he still has questions, obviously, because he's 86 and has no biological children. This is now the end of the story, starting with verse 18. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made, the Hebrew said, cut a covenant with Abram, saying, and there is something that God says. What happened? So after Abraham still has questions, God tells him, okay, Abraham, take these specific animals, cut them in two, put them on one side and the other, and Let's see what is going to happen. So what is happening there? Well, for most of the day, nothing. But then when the dark comes, a fire, a fire pot, a torch passes through those pieces. And that's when God cuts a covenant. The biblical concept of the covenant is not making a covenant, not entering into a covenant. It is to cut a covenant. 
And there's a reason why. There's a reason why those animals were cut into two pieces. Normally, in the context of those days, when somebody entered into covenant with somebody else, for instance, there was a king that overcame a city and became a suzerain of a city. The king of that city that was overcome became a vassal of that suzerain king. And they would enter into a covenant. How? They would cut some animals into half, usually in the Hittite way of doing it. The Hittites were a people that used to live in the area of Canaan, but then they moved toward Anatolia in uh, modern Turkey. So the way they would do it is they would cut the animals, donkeys, in two pieces, and then the king that has to submit to the powerful king would pass through those pieces. The meaning of the ritual was simple. If I rebel against you, if I do not submit to your authority, this is what should happen to me. I should be cut into two. I can imagine when Abraham heard God telling him, hey, you should bring those animals, cut them in two, and uh, put them one side and the other, he thought, okay, so now God wants me to pass through them, showing that uh, if I rebel against him, then I will be cut into two. But that's not what happens in the story. Instead of God having Abraham walk to the cut animals, who walks to the cut animals? God himself walks through the animals, telling Abraham, if I ever let you down, this is what should happen to me. So that's the concept of covenant cut by God between him and Abraham. And it has connections to the fact that the Messiah, according to the book of Daniel, at one point was cut, cut off. And at the cross, the Messiah was, so to speak, cut off. So the covenant has long-lasting implications. But this is Genesis chapter 15. And that's where the covenant is first mentioned. The Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. The name change is not happening yet. If you look in the Bible, after chapter 15, there is another story that speaks about Ishmael. Because although Abraham at this point understood he will procreate, and somebody will come out of his body, his heir, what he could not get, and probably his wife had even a harder time, is how Sarah would be able to have a child at that age. So Sarah comes up with a plan, and that's how you have the story of Hagar and uh, Ishmael. A story that complicates the story. And at one point, Abraham even pleads with God, saying, Hey, please let Ishmael live before you. And God says, Yes, he will live before me. I will bless Ishmael too. But the one that will inherit you, the blessings and everything, the blessing that says that in you all the families will be blessed is not Ishmael. I will make him a great nation. I will bless him in many ways. But the one inheriting the blessing that goes across the earth is your son 
that will be biological son of you and Sarai. But at that time, God intervenes in chapter 17 and changes the name from Abram to Abraham as if Ishmael is the son of whom? Abram or Abraham? Abram. And Isaac is the son of whom? Abraham. And Sarai becomes Sarah. And both names have the concept of multitude, of many, of lots of people, father and mother of lots of people. Okay. Go now to chapter 17. In chapter 17, the concept of covenant appears 13 times. When Abram was 99 years old, so now he's 99, before he was what? 86, so it's 13 years apart. So when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Please notice that here it's not making covenant in the sense of cutting a covenant. Because the covenant has already been cut in chapter 15. This is to say I am renewing or I'm establishing or I'm working out the covenant with you. The covenant exists already based on chapter 15. Here God comes and says, I will establish or work out my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. So this makes it obvious that the covenant exists already. What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement. In this case, between God and Abraham. My covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. But your name shall be Abraham. Abraham means exalted father. Abraham means, for I have made you a father of many nations, or a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations, watch this, verse 7, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. You may have heard that in the Bible, everlasting or eternal is not everlasting or eternal in the sense that it will never stop. It is everlasting or eternal in the sense that it goes as long as the people that are involved exist. One example, Samuel. Samuel is taken by his mother to the temple. You remember the story. And the Bible says that Samuel was left there, and there he stayed everlastingly or forever. Does that mean that if I go now to Jerusalem and look for Samuel, I'll find him in the temple? No. Why? Because neither Samuel nor the temple exist. But as long as Samuel existed, because obviously he died before the temple was destroyed, as long as he existed, he was in the temple. But here's the thing, with Abraham, God 
establishes an everlasting covenant, not only with him individually, but also with his descendants. So how long will the covenant last? As long as his descendants are alive or will last. But the question is, do his descendants still last? And the answer is yes. Who are those? There are the biological descendants of Abraham. But then if you look at John chapter 8, when Jesus says, if you were Abraham's sons, speaking to the Jews, you would not do these things. Because not everybody that comes from the genealogy or biologically from Abraham is Abraham's son. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, it's made obvious that those who believe just the way Abraham believed in God, and it was accounted to him as what? As righteousness? Those become heirs or Abraham's descendants. That's the teaching of the Bible. So in verse 9 it says, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. Verse 10, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. And then you have a description of circumcision. Verse 11, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of of the covenant between me and you. Man, are you circumcised? Yes or no? No? Why are you not? You are not Jews, but are they Abraham's descendants? Well, there's a simple answer to that. The Apostle Paul says that we are not supposed those coming from among the Gentiles. We are not supposed to be circumcised in the flesh, but circumcised in the heart, right? So there is an explicit biblical passage in the New Testament that says this will be canceled out. There is a reason why God gives exactly this uh, foreskin cutting as a symbol of the covenant on the human side. Because this circumcision has to do with the area of the human body, the manly human body, that is involved in the love relationship between man and woman in a specific way that somehow symbolizes the spiritual reality between God and His people. God is the husband of the wife that is Israel. And you can even read, for instance, in the book of Isaiah, that your God is your husband. So practically, God places a sign on the manly body, because we are dealing with a patriarchal society there, that shows, that tells, at a very intimate level, these people, Abraham's people, Abraham's descendants, they belong to one husband, that is God. Verse 13, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Again, verse 14, And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So it's pretty serious. Verse 21, 
But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. I skipped verse 19. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And then verse 23 says, So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house and all who were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very same day as God had said to him. Have you noticed something weird here? Although God says the one that carries on the covenant, the blessing of the covenant, is who? Isaac. He still circumcised the other boy as well, Ishmael. God did not give up on Ishmael. On the contrary, God blessed Ishmael. And I think we have potent evidence in the Bible that although God in his providence used the people of Israel in a special, in a peculiar way, he did not give up on the other people or peoples around them either. I remember a few weeks ago, one of our sisters from this church, who is a Chinese lady, she posted on Facebook, this guy, it was about a Chinese guy, speaks about the gospel, pointing out that even in the old days, in the Chinese culture, there were tokens of God specifically working with the Chinese people as well. So we should not have the tunnel view according to which, yes, God loved or loves Israel and that's it. Nobody else counts. No, no, that's not the biblical teaching. The biblical teaching, yes, God used these people, has been using these people throughout history, but God cared about everybody, every people and every individual. That is my presentation. It's your turn for questions. Good observation. Would you please repeat the page? 364. Patriarchs and Prophets 364. It points out that the whole Abrahamic covenant would not have been needed had they obeyed God's law, God's principles of life before. Because remember, at the time of Noah, when they came out from the ark, God already cut a covenant with them. So in the, the Noahic covenant, God practically entered into a covenant with the entire population of the world at that time. So somehow what we see in the Abrahamic story and the Abrahamic covenant and circumcision as a sign of the covenant is a sort of a plan B of divine intervention in the plan of salvation in which after things again became very complicated and wicked, God again intervenes and says, uh, let's do this now. Why was that necessary, some may ask? Well, I strongly believe that much of what we have in the Bible has a role of demonstration in front of the whole universe. Thank you so much for pointing out that. So, when the Bible uses um, the concepts of forever, or forever and ever, concept of eternity. Does the Bible refer to eons? I think this concept of eons is more like a modern and uh, science fiction 
kind of thing than a biblical kind of reality. But the Bible uses in the Old Testament is olam, that's the Hebrew word, which again means ongoing as long as those involved exist. So that's the concept of olam in the Old Testament. And uh, in the New Testament, it's ionios, a translation of uh, olam from the Hebrew. And it's the same concept. For instance, it is said in the Old Testament about Sodom and Gomorrah that they were burned with an everlasting fire. If you take everlasting fire in the sense of uh, eons, then you should be able to go somewhere on this globe, search for the place where Sodom and Gomorrah were, and uh, see the fire still burning there, if that's the concept. But that's not the concept. The concept is that fire will not stop, will not be quenched, as long as there is something to fuel that fire. And the same thing is uh, in the New Testament. Now, when it comes to God, there are specific Bible verses that tell us that God's eternity, God's being everlasting, never ceases. It has no start and no end. I know this is a stretch of uh, the mind, so how is that? Because my daughter asks me who created God. Because God created everything, but who created God? And uh, the only answer we have to that is nobody created God. Because God, by definition, is a non-created being that is postulated as existing without anybody being behind his existence as a cause, as a source for that. When you go to obtain citizenship here in America, you have the option of changing your name. And some people do that. That doesn't necessarily mean anything else changed because uh, a change of uh, name in our mentality today does not necessarily involve any kind of change of identity in the character of that person. What we see in the Bible, however, is that here we have a change of identity, both in Abram to Abram's case and in Sarai to Sarah's case. Of course, there is another application, a biblical spiritual application to this. When we, when we accept Jesus Christ, we receive a new name. And uh, that new name is uh, a symbol, if you want, of our new identity and new character in Jesus Christ. It's a faith reality, a spiritual reality. So, if we have ceremonies, rituals in the Old Testament, if those were canceled, the word uh, Alan used is adjusted, then why are we still, as Christians, so much ceremonial? Why do we still uh, keep so many ceremonies? rituals. First of all, when we speak about the adjustment of the covenant, we want to see exactly what we are speaking about. There is an aspect of the covenant that was adjusted. For instance, the circumcision. We have strong evidence in the New Testament that circumcision is not needed today as a sign of the covenant of being or entering or cutting a covenant with God. That is pretty clear. The Bible does not say it cannot happen. 
Okay? The Bible doesn't say if somebody wants to circumcise uh, their boys, they cannot do it. So that is changed, adjusted in your language. Then we have obviously things that we can call ceremonial or ritual that have to do with uh, the sacrifice system of the Old Testament that were all pointing to Jesus Christ, the real sacrifice. Once Jesus died and the sacrifice was given, obviously we don't need to repeat those ceremonies because the real sacrifice was already brought and uh, those foreshadowing of the sacrifice I believe can be seen as uh, sandbox illustrations of what was going to happen. Because God intended to teach these people of uh, former slaves coming out of Egypt to understand what the plan of salvation is, how this will be fixed or worked out by God, how the problem of rebellion of uh, planet Earth against God will be eventually fixed. And in the sanctuary system, all those lessons were given, including the removal of sin through the goat of Azazel, which is sent into the wilderness, just like Satan, in the end, will be sent into the wilderness and will be destroyed. So that's the sandbox illustration. Obviously, after the real sacrifice was brought, we don't bring those ceremonies. Nevertheless, and please hear me out here, this concept that life is possible without rituals or spiritual life is possible without rituals is a false concept. We as human beings, we function in a ritualistic way. Not in a ritualistic way, in the sense of mechanical way, but it's part of life. Let me just give you some rituals. When you wake up in the morning, you have some rituals, don't you? A child, and this is very important for parents, a child will have a chaotic life. If you as a parent are not able to instill in the child's mind some rituals which are part of the normalcy of life. There are parents that for some reason, based on I don't know what kind of uh, modern and postmodern ideology, they kicked out every ritual. I was told as a young parent when my first child was born, that I should allow that child to do whatever that child wants to do. Because we don't, don't want to set limits and, hey, 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 hey. What is that? I mean, of course you want to allow that child to develop. But you want to instill healthy rituals. If you receive $10, for instance, you want to teach your child that the first thing to do is take one dollar, set it aside, because that's not yours. That is a ritual. It didn't change. Jesus did not cancel it out. He said, well, those should be done and these should not be overlooked. Okay? So life does function based on some rituals. But here's the thing. There are rituals that are biblical and spiritual. For instance, one biblical spiritual ritual is he wakes or awakens my ears every morning so that I can listen like a disciple. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. It's a prayer kind of ritual that happens every morning with the Lord, meaning when I wake up in the morning, my first thought is connection with God. And there are rituals that are purely or merely cultural. Much of what we do as a religious 
person or even as a religious people have purely cultural background. For instance, who tells us that the worship service that we have in the church has to happen in the exact same manner? Somebody goes and makes announcements, and then uh, somebody comes and introduces us into song service, somebody prays, somebody does children's story, and there is a certain ritual. If you belong to this church, without giving you a script every Sabbath, you already can anticipate what the next point will be, right? Now, some people, if you mess up the program, will get into some sort of existential crisis and say, no, pastor, we cannot do this. When in fact, those are rituals, mostly cultural. Well, the elements are not cultural because you want to sing, you want to pray, you want to preach in the church. But nobody has established in the Bible the exact order what follows what. So the problem is when we take some human traditions, Jesus said, you have nicely taken your human tradition and canceled out the divine commandments. That is a problem with rituals. But having rituals, we all have rituals. You have your own specific rituals. You come home from uh, work and uh, you sit down and uh, scroll your phone, uh, smartphone, then jump up and uh, go to the gym, then come home and fight with your wife and you know, well, take that part out. But we have rituals. Yeah? The point is we don't want to elevate human rituals, even good, to the level where we say that is what God wants. And if uh, somebody doesn't do the rituals the way you do, then you will shake your head and say, no, no, God doesn't like that. Yeah, because you went to the Lord and you checked with Him. And you said, hey, do you like His ritual? No, I don't. Okay, I'm going to go and tell Him. <laughs> See what the problem is? But healthy ritual is part of normalcy. God established a six plus one a ritualistic way for the week. Six days you go and work, and that's a commandment too, okay? So it's not the only rest one day. The commandment also says work six days. It's a ritual. Then you stay one day and uh, have rest in the Lord. And then you start again. Isn't that a ritual? It is. We have a ritual of the day. You start your day when? At what time? Obviously, in the evening. Society has taught us we start the day in the morning. That's not true. Biblically, you start the day in the evening. Sleeping. That's how you start the day. You sleep first, get a good rest, and then you become active in the morning, and it goes all the way to the next evening. And then the ritual starts again. Life is a ritual. If you do the right ritual, you live life in the right way. A ritual even in Jesus Christ. Not unnecessary and burdensome and uh, lifeless rituals. Yes? Good question. I am not uh, in the field. The question is how did they do circumcision in those days? From what we were taught from history, we know that uh, knives were sharp stones. How did they clean those sharp stones so it will not uh, cause infection? Well, I believe uh, they had methods. Fire is one of them. So uh, most likely stone knives, if they didn't have metal at that time. We know of one specific circumcision that was done specifically with 
stone knife. Can somebody tell me when and who did it? This, this guy called Moses married a woman that wasn't even from uh, Isaac's uh, genealogy. Moses' wife. Sephora or Tsipora, depending how you, you pronounce her name. Yeah, at one point uh, when uh, God uh, had a strong interaction with Moses, she kind of uh, got the idea or the message from the Lord that the problem was the lack of circumcision of Moses' uh, descendants. So she took a sharp stone and did the circumcision. You know there is this concept of the new covenant out there under which some people believe that everything else was canceled out. And they quote some specific Bible passages from the New Testament. One of them being uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Or they quote what Jesus said uh, when uh, he said this is the blood of the new covenant. And they say, you see, this is a, about a new covenant. So that means Christians are under a new covenant. Everything from the old is gone. But that's, what's very interesting is they read this verse, for instance, but they don't see what the verse really says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. So then how is it a covenant made with the house of Israel and then you say that everything that belongs or refers to Israel is not in use any longer? See the problem? And they also miss the point because this is a quotation. It's quoted from Jeremiah 31. It is a covenant that God renews, actually. That's the whole meaning of it. And the Apostle Paul puts it in a different language in uh, Romans chapter 11. He says, there was a wild olive tree and a noble or domestic olive tree. The domestic olive tree is Israel. The wild olive tree is the Gentiles. So then what happened? Some branches of uh, the domestic olive tree fell apart because of apostasy and they were cut off. And branches of uh, the wild olive tree were taken and grafted into this noble or domestic olive tree. And now Israel is this. It is a composite, if you want, or a uh, complex, non-ethnic, not exclusively ethnic people in which you have indeed the roots, the Abrahamic roots, but in Abraham will all the people of the world all the families of the world will be blessed, right? So it's obvious that we have a continuity of the covenant, not one covenant here, a breach or a gap, and then another covenant here. It's the same covenant which was again and again broken, if you want, by the human party, but God would not break it. Why? Because he's faithful. And he said to Abraham, if I let you down, let me be cut into two. Even when we let him down, it was God that was cut into two in Jesus Christ. Because if you see the Father and the Son together, through death, they were cut into two. That's it. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. 
May the Holy Spirit deepen it in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen.